thank you, Stephen, uh, for the invitation. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and I look forward to sharing this work with you. So today I am uh, excited to present new work for a project that will be separate from my dissertation. And the provisional title for my project is Blindness and Experience. And it asks the following questions. How does a blind person experience painting or sculpture? How does a blind person observe nature? Unbeknownst even to many intellectual historians, the early modern period abounded with blind knowers and makers. Meet Giovanni, um, is this? Meet Giovanni Gonelli, the sculptor who created busts from terracotta for the Grand Duke of Tuscany, as well as the Pope. Meet Nicholas Saunderson, the Lucasian professor of mathematics, who invented a system of arithmetic by moving pegs across a tabulated board. Or simply recall a figure that everyone in this audience knows, the blind poet John Milton, England's Homer. We could continue with a long list of blind painters and musical composers, blind naturalists and mathematicians who left their mark on early modern art and science. My objective is not to identify every single individual, but to study how visually impaired observers shaped the high culture of knowledge and experience. The reason I think such a study is needed is that our perceptions of these figures has changed in problematic ways. In the Enlightenment, an obsession arose with blind virtuosi. Flowing from the pen of Diderot and others, a romanticized image emerged of the blind Noah as an inwardly focused recluse who could divine the truths of poetry, science, and nature without the use of his eyes. In the 19th and 20th century, the notion of blind genius only became amplified within nationalist narratives. Look at this 19th century engraving of a blind musician from the 17th century Low Countries. It depicts how the blind musician Jakob van Eyck turned inwards and used his heightened sense of sound to instruct his assistants on how to tune the bells, the very moment that supposedly marked the Dutch invention of the carillon. What I want to highlight here is how blindness was instrumentalized for the idea of Dutch genius. The image adorned a publication entitled Laurebladen uit Nederland's Gloria Krantz, Laurel Leaves from the Glorious Reef of the Netherlands. My project, Blindness and Experience, questions these narratives. Combining sensory history with disability studies, it aims to deconstruct enlightenment notions and to reconnect visually impaired knowers to their historical environments and the way they experienced them. Today, I want to present my first exploratory case study, the blind naturalist Georg Eberhard Umfius. Two seemingly contradictory facts are well known. One is that Rumpheus was a gifted observer, celebrated for his descriptions of shells, which he studied on the Indonesian spice islands. The second fact is that he was blind. If we more look more closely at the likeness of Rumpheus, which was produced in the last years of his life, we encounter the paradoxical notion of blind genius. The inscription at the bottom describes Rumpheus as a blind man who possesses the sharp eyes of such a vigorous intellect that no one is better at seeing or discovering things. No one, to my knowledge, has resolved this paradox satisfactorily. How could a, how could a naturalist who studied shells be blind? How did Rumpfus make observations and descriptions about things he could not see? My approach to this question will be both speculative and experimental. Because Rumpfus did not write down his method, sadly a fate that befell many other blind knowers, I have availed myself of another aid. My guide will be Gerard Vermeer, 
a blank oncologist and professor of geology at the University of California at Davis. In his autobiography, Privileged Hands, Bermet explains how his heightened sense of touch allows him to examine shells in the greatest detail by using his hands and fingers. He writes, it is the ability to turn shells in the hand that allows me to appreciate their form and relief from many perspectives. Inspection of an object with fingertips, fingernails, and thin needles reveals not only the broad outlines, but also the small scale details. The number, relative size, and orientation of elements of sculpture, the placement of teeth and folds surrounding snail shell apertures, the pattern and asymmetry of clam valve serrations. Details that a casual observer is apt to overlook. To give you a sense of what this looks like in practice, here is Fermé applying his tactile mode of observation. Drawing on Fermé to read sources against the grain, I argue that Rumpius used his hands in place of his eyes to study shells. Let me highlight a neglected detail in Rumpus's likeness. Look at the table. His right hand is grasping the branch while his middle finger explores a leaf and his index finger touches a shell. My paper today will attempt to reconstruct how the blind naturalist used his tactile senses to explore the world of the tropics rendering his haptic sensations into observations and descriptions that equaled, or in my opinion, surpassed those of sighted observers. I will try to substantiate these claims and investigate their possibilities and limits. Important recent works by Jessica Riskin and Mark Paterson have analyzed early modern ideas about blindness. While both authors do not study blind knowers themselves, they highlight something equally important, period ideas about blindness. For example, they trace how natural philosophers theorized the man born blind and restored to light as a thought experiment that could probe the relationship between vision and the world, and whether vision was essential for, for participation in civic life. With these studies in mind, I will labor to bring my analysis into conversation with period ideas. In his famous Dioptrique, René Descartes invoked the example of a blind man using a cane to navigate his surroundings. Descartes claimed, one might also say that they see with their hands. Taking seriously the idea that hands can see, an idea vehemently contested throughout the period, I will attempt to show that Rumpus's tactile observations resulted in a form of visual knowing. Moreover, I want to reflect on what this meant in an epistemological era that privileged visual observation over alternate modes of experience. My talk is split into three parts. First, I will set the scene and situate Rumpius in 17th century Indonesia as a merchant of the Dutch East India Company. Second, I will study what I call his tactile epistemology, rereading his visual descriptions and observations of shells as arising from haptic exploration. In conclusion, I will draw on the contemporary philosophy of mind to further reflect on my arguments and problematize my reconstruction by imposing some methodological constraints. Before we begin, I want to briefly discuss two conceptions of blindness that were prevalent in Rumpus's time. And the reason I mentioned them is because they are still prevalent today. The first is that blindness entailed a complete lack of sight, often imagined as walking through darkness. Here, for example, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau in his Emile. We observe that the blind have a surer and keener touch than we do, 
because not being guided by sight, they are forced to learn to draw solely on the former sense. Why then are we not given practice at walking as a blind do in darkness? Today, we acknowledge that blindness comes in degrees. It's better to say that visual ability forms a spectrum. A good way to imagine this is to think of an eye exam. You are in a doctor's office and see the letters clearly on the wall. Then you are given a stronger lens and the letters become fuzzier. Imagine that the lenses keep getting stronger. Shapes become more blurry, colors begin to mix into each other, and at some point, your mind will not be able to distinguish discrete shapes or colors. You can no longer discern what is in front of you, but light is still flowing in. A second early idea about blindness was that it entailed that notions of color and shape would become meaningless because these ideas were visual and derived their meaning from visual experience. So John Locke, for example, wrote in his essay concerning human understanding, I would have anyone try to fancy any taste which had never affected his palate or frame the idea of a scent he had never smelt. And when he can do, can do this, I will also conclude that a blind man has ideas of colors. Note how the imagined blind man is conjured up as a reductio ad absurdum for Locke's preferred view. In Locke's epistemology, a blind person could not make meaningful use of visual language. Is another quote, the simple ideas we have are such as experience teaches them us. But if beyond that, we endeavor by words to make them clear in the mind, we shall succeed no better than if we went about to clear up the darkness of a blind man's mind by talking and to discourse into him the ideas of light and color. Over the last 50 years, cognitive, science, cognitive scientists have shown that even individuals that are born blind talk meaningfully about colors. They assign different colors to different objects and give reasons for doing so. The newest research from John Hopkins University, which directly responds to Locke's texts, shows that blind-born individuals develop rich theories of color. They make meaningful use of color words through judgment and inference, and they use visual vocabulary extremely competently. So these are the two things that I want to keep in mind. First, that blindness does not equal darkness, but the diminishment of sight. And second, that blind individuals can become competent users of visual vocabulary. You might find it difficult to grasp this latter point, but I hope that my analysis of Rumpius will give a sense of how a blind naturalist was able to observe nature in full. Setting the scene. Jörg Eberhard Rumpf grew up in central Germany in Hanau. Born in 1627, he received a classical education at the local gymnasium and was trained as an engineer by his father. At the age of 19, Rumpius was recruited as a mercenary and fought in battles in Venice and Lisbon. For a short time, he returned to his hometown as a Bauschreiber, managing construction projects for the Count of Nassau and picking up valuable skills in design and administration. But in 1652, at the age of 25, he left Europe forever and set sail for the East Indies as a gentleman soldier. One and a half years later, he arrived in Indonesia at the settlement of Batavia. It was customary to give new arrivals three day off, and we can imagine Rumpius disappearing into local taverns and brothels, or exploring the hilltop zoo that housed rhinos, tigers, and crocodiles. After decades of fighting with the Portuguese and English, the Dutch East India Company had imposed its monopoly over the Spice Islands. This was far from a Dutch Eden. It was rather an Asian Babel 
filled with Chinese and Japanese immigrants, Muslim merchants, and an ethnic mis miscellany from all over the archipelago, speaking different tongues, worshiping different gods, and sporting different dresses. Signing a five-year contract, Rumpius became an employee of the Dutch East India Company and was stationed at Gila on the island of Ambon. He quickly climbed the ranks and turned from mercenary to merchant. In his early years, he designed fortifications and oversaw construction projects. In his later years, he was a senior merchant at the council and was able to carry out his own research on the natural history of the Spice Islands. In the 1660s, he began to record his observations on plants, and these would form the basis for the first volumes of his posthumous herbal, the Kraut book. But then tragedy struck. In May 1670, the governor of Ambon reported, quote, that the merchant Rumpheus became blind several weeks ago. There is an autobiographical poem in which Rumpheus describes turning blind, but I will quote from the two letters in which he talks about his blindness in real time. The first is a letter in the Dutch East India Company archives in The Hague. The governor of Batavia had summoned Rumpheus to the settlement fortress to which Rumpheus replied, it is impossible for me to undertake any trip because of the minimal appearance of strong daylight. The little light left in my one eye is my only solace, so that it pains me that a few days later, I will not be able to see anything. 10 years later, we have a second letter to the physician Christian Menzel, published in the Proceedings of the Leopoldina. Rumpius writes, divine will, which undoubtedly looks after my health more than I do, took away the entire world with all its creatures from my sight, which is why I am forced to sit in sad darkness for my 10th year. The black cataract taking over my eyes caused this. As Susanne Friedrich points out, this was not just a personal tragedy for Rumpheus, but it fundamental, fundamentally changed his relationship with the company. Loss of sight usually terminated active service. And it was only due to the intervention of high-ranking officials that Rumpheus, who enjoyed an image as a good employee, was able to maintain his position. He was removed from Gila and was stationed at Quarter Ambon in this house, where most of his work took place. Rumpius was able to leverage company resources for his scholarship, in particular scribes to whom he dictated observations and who acquired books from the Amsterdam market. As my colleague at Princeton, Jeannie Yu, has shown, Rumpius drew on a much broader network that extended across the archipelago, involving local religious leaders and elite Muslim merchants through whom he learned the medicinal properties of plants, their Malay names, as well as their uses in ritualistic magic. I think this insight fits into a colorful picture of early modern knowledge. Historians as diverse as Sachiko Kuzukawa, Stephen Shapin, and Anne Blair have shown how naturalists relied on illustrators and engravers, scholars on amanuenses, and experimental scientists on instrument builders and technicians. Rumpius's use of scribes and informants was no exception. Important though, is that we do not single him out. Herat Ferme has warned of the pernicious implications of stressing that a blind man cannot work without assistance. He soberly notes that sighted colleagues need field and research assistance all the time. I believe we can hence carve out a space for Rumpius. We can imagine Rumpius in his house in Kota Ambon, where he resided after going blind. This is where objects like shells were brought to him and where his collection and library were housed. It is here that Rumpius did the work of observing. <laughs>
tactile epistemology. I now turn to Rumpia's observations on shells in the Ambanese Curiosity Cabinet, the Ambonche Baritatekammer of 1705. The book has a complicated, a very complicated production history. What is important for my purposes is that the several of the images were added later in Europe and depict only comparable specimens. I argue, however, that that doesn't matter. Rumphius did not see. Whatever images adorn this book, they cannot represent anything he saw. I propose that we use the images as a visual aid to imagine what he touched. Gerard Ferme writes that observation by hand is particularly well suited to objects the size of most shells. And he makes a good point. Unlike very large objects, shells can be examined and enveloped through the use of both hands. Hence, a good place to begin are Rumpius's observations on size. Consider the following examples. Of this particular shell, Rumpius writes, it is the Chote van ein Faust, the size of a fist. Or look at this example. Of this shell, Rumpius writes, it is no longer than the nail of a thumb. Or of this shell, he writes, that the shell's opening is a hand's width in diameter. Whereas in this case, he writes, that the opening is two or three fingers wide. Note how Rumpius was using his hands to measure the shell's dimensions. He lined up his fingers on top of the shell to make measurements. He inserted his hands inside the shell to gorge the interior. He held shells next to his fist or thumb to determine size. In one case, he noted that the shells were the length of an index finger and barely the thickness of a pinky, ain pink. He was using all the various opportunities that his hands provided. Let me move on to how Rumpius developed an empirical vocabulary for describing the form and appearance of shells. One of the good things about being in Indonesia was that tropical shells possessed interesting surface textures, perfect for tactile exploration. About these shells, which have an almost ceramic-like composition, Rumpius observed, this kind of shell consists mostly of a few knobs, like, a cer like certain small and knobbly glasses called pimpliches, from which one drinks brandy wine. I did some digging in the Fawotse archives and found that pimpliches were the name that the Dutch East India Company gave to Chinese drinking cups that were shipped to Europe. Here you see the actual cups that were recovered from a Dutch East India shipwreck in the 1980s. This is exactly the type of commodity that a Dutch East India merchant like Rumpius would have owned and used to drink alcohol from. In the Kangxi period, which is Rumpfus's time, these porcelain cups came in many different varieties. They had ridges, they had complex ornaments, and even novels. So when you go back to Rumpfus's comparison, you will note this was not a visual analogy. It was a tactile one. It is not that the shells looked like the cups. They felt like them. I want to invoke John Locke to think about Rumpius's language of tactility through a contemporary lens. In Locke's model of the mind, new ideas could be triggered if they were similar to ideas that have preceded them, what Locke famously called the association of ideas. When Rumpius touched the knobbly porcelain-like shells, he was reminded of an Asian drinking ornament. And what is fascinating is that both of these ideas were tactile. Rumpius drew on a variety of tactile experiences. 
These Indonesian murex shells, for example, were a true feast for his hands. Rumpius let his fingers explore their protruding spines, and he was very precise about recording their number and arrangement. In this case, he was reminded of needles or thorns, thorn, or branches, getakt, branched. Other analogies were more functional. For example, these shells reminded him of infantry helmets or Sturmchoden. And here is a contemporary image of Sturmchoden. The point was that the mollusk inhabiting the shell wore it like a helmet. I proposed hence that memory played an important role for his tactility. When Rumpius touched shells, he associated them with tactile experiences and mental images that were stored in his mind. I'm particularly fascinated by how Rumpius's tactile memory allowed him to recognize shells that have become fossilized. For example, he observed, now they have been so overgrown for a long period of time that people consider them to be rocks. But if one examines them more closely, one can easily determine from the course of the ridges or waves that they are shells. Remarkably, his hands were exploring a completely different type of material, rock, and his fingertips remembered the ridged surface of the shells he had previously examined. He continued, on the inside, they are solid and dense as some white marble can be. One can easily detect the various layers there that other seashells have. His tactile memory extended to the internal structure of shells themselves. A good point of comparison here is the Italian naturalist Ulisse Aldrovandi. A renowned professor of botany and prolific collector, Aldrovandi owned many stones that resembled other things visually stones that resembled hands, stones that resembled snakes, slabs that outlined the figure of a monk, so that when Aldravandi got to this stone, he was unsure, was this actually a shell, or was this just in the eye of the beholder? Aldravandi's approach was pictorial, but for Rumpius, there was something about touching the fossil its familiar layout and structure that persuaded him that these were shells in a petrified state. Rumpius even conducted experiments to prove that the shells had turned entirely to stone. He writes, they will not fire much at night the way common flintstones will, though they might give off a few sparks when struck together and produce a flinty smell which is a proof that they have pretty much adopted the stone-like nature. What is interesting is that Rumpus did this at night. The reason I think is that during the day, he could not perceive the sparks, but at night he was able to perceive them ever so dimly as he struck the fossils together. I now come to my last example of Rumpus's tactile observations. And the reason I think this example is important is because it shows how his tactile observations allowed him to make an intervention in the learned literature. There were two famous chapters in Pliny's Natural History, chapters 29 and 30 in book nine, that offered descriptions of a tropical shell creature called Nautilus or Nauplius. And the inherent ambiguity of Pliny's description had long left European commentators confused as to whether Pliny had meant this creature, sometimes called the paper nautilus because its shell is as thin as paper, or this creature, sometimes called the pearly nautilus. Here, for example, you see the treatment by the Polish naturalist John Johnston who discussed the chapters in Pliny and decided to associate them with both types of nautilus. And I've 
uh, separated here, mark them through A and B. Um, A is the paper nautilus on the top, and B is the pearly nautilus on the bottom. This precedent had been established in the 16th century by the Frenchman Pierre Bellon, who had posited that there must be two types of nautilus that Pliny had meant. In contrast to previous naturalists, Rumpius, Rumpius actually studied these creatures in their native regions, and he came to different conclusions. Rumpius began with his own tactile exploration and description of both nautilus shells. He then quoted the ancient descriptions given by Pliny. So here we see uh, both types of nautiluses in Rumpius's treatise. And uh, Rumpius quotes here Pliny, we have chapter nine, book 29, and here's the entire description from Pliny. Here's chapter 30, and here's the entire description of Pliny. And we can imagine that a scribal assistant must have read out these passages aloud while Rumpius used his hands to feel whether they fitted to the shell before him. He concluded, both of these descriptions fit our thin nautilus, the paper nautilus, which Johnston following Bellon describes somewhat clearer. Rumpius in fact concludes that it is the thin paper nautilus that is the true nautilus, the eigentliche nautilus, and the only one that appears to have been known to the ancients. Not only did he match Pliny's description to the shell using his hands, but he made judgments about the accuracy of modern accounts as well. He wrote, Bellonius, Bellon, has described it precisely, and he gives the entire description that Bellon gives. That's a remarkable moment in his natural history. And it needs mentioning that Rumpf's account of the Nautilus became the canonical treatment that will be cited for the next century. Other minds. I want to conclude and think about the methodology and implications of my paper a bit. My main argument is that we can recover tactile practices of observation if we open ourselves to more speculative ways of reading the sources. Unlike, say, Robert Boyle, who made great rhetorical efforts to reflect on the methods behind his empiricism, blind knowledge makers in the early modern period weren't in, an, in a position to establish an epistemological program. And that is in many ways still true today. Hence, why I find Gerard Fermé's autobiography so valuable. I am, the I am of the opinion that we must avail ourselves of all available resources and see how far these methods can take us. One might object that Rumpius never mentioned using his hands. There is no sentence in the book where Rumpius says, I used my hands. Why not? I can only speculate as to the reason. I think he might have been concerned that his observations would have been seen as a lesser form of empiricism if he acknowledged that they came from his hands. The period he lived in was one that fetishized the idea that knowledge was attained visually. Microscopes and telescopes had opened up new visual worlds, scientific books, were filled with illustrations, universal languages and mental concepts were thought to be pictorial or imagistic. The epistemo epistemological ruptures of the 17th century have certainly shaped our views of empiricism very deeply. And figures like Rumpius, I think, allow us to retell this story in exciting new ways. One reason for taking my analysis further, I claim, is that it also has wider implications. Let me return to some of the examples that I plan to explore in this project. Note how the blind mathematician was holding an armillary sphere 
which he was able to manipulate with his fingers. Or note how the blind sculptor could feel his way across the three-dimensional bust while the two-dimensional image lay unengaged by the table. Scholars of sensory history have argued that the sound of the church bell and the, the smell of the slave pen are important subjects of historical analysis. And if that is possible as a mode of historical practice, then I think we should also apply it to the history of sensory knowledge. I also want to place some constraints on this idea. The American philosopher Thomas Nagel once argued in an essay that became the cornerstone of modern philosophy of mind, that subjective experience can never be captured by an outsider. His example were bats. Bats do not primarily use vision or touch at night, but bounce sound waves off of their environment to navigate through it. What does it feel like to observe nature in this way? Nagel's answer was that we will never know. No matter how sophisticated our understanding of the physics of waves or the physiology of the brain, this form of experience is intractable to third parties. Let me replay the video I showed at the beginning. With Nagel, we can say a sighted onlooker will never be able to comprehend purely tactile exploration. I hence see this type of material not as a key that unlocks a hidden experience. Rather, I see it as a visual aid to us who are unable to observe in this way. It offers an imperfect tool of understanding. But one thing is clear, the experience of blind knowers is theirs alone. I want to end my talk here with a short poem by the late William Stanley Merwin, because it articulates so much more beautifully what I've been struggling to say. Uh, these are the last lines of the poem and will be the last lines of the presentation. I take a shell in my hand new to itself and to me. I feel the thinness, the warmth, and the cold. I listen to the water, which is the story welling up. I remember the colors and their lives. Everything takes me by surprise. It is all awake in the darkness. Thank you.